Mark, Luke, wherever Matthew didn't cover, we're going to cover those in Mark or Luke. We're in Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 59 this evening. If you have your Bible with you, turn with me to Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 59. Title of my message this evening is a question. Are you ready for Christ's return? Are you ready for Christ's return? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time now to study your word. And my prayer is that everyone who hears that question will be, will be able to say yes. Will be able to say yes. And if not now, by the end of the message, they will be able to say yes. We thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you so much that you want us to know the truth about Christ's return. So we pray, Father God, that you would use this time to inspire us, to motivate us, to cleanse us, to prune us, to refine us, because we want to be ready. We want to be eager. Father, we want to be about your business until Christ comes. And we pray that you'd anoint this time with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen and amen. Well, as you saw on your way in tonight, spring is finally here. Praise God. My favorite time of the year. I mean, you got the flowers blooming. You got the allergies kicking in. It is great. The best time of the year. I tell you what, and the other day I, I came across this funny story about these four high school seniors who were smitten bad with a bad case of spring fever. You know, they, they got nailed with that spring fever and they just couldn't resist the temptation to skip their morning classes. So after lunch, they waltz into the school and they reported to their teacher that their car had a flat tire. Well, much to their relief, the teacher smiled and said, well, you missed a quiz this morning, so take your seats, get out, of a pen, get out a pencil and a paper. Still smiling, the teacher waited patiently as the four seniors settled down and got ready for her questions. And then she said, first question, which tire was flat? <laughs> oh, there you have it. Accountability accountability, whether we like it or not, all of us, without exception, will be held accountable for our choices. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. And contrary to the way accountability is often applied today, when we stand before God, it will be impartial. Oh, it will be thorough, just, and final. You see, Jesus Christ is coming back. And the question for us is, are we ready for his return? Now, here's the good news. God wants all of us to be ready. God gave us his inspired, inerrant, infallible word, the Bible, which tells us step by step, how to be ready for Christ's return. In many ways, it's like an open book final exam. We know the answers in advance. And tonight we will learn how to be ready for Jesus' return as we look to his words in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 35. It reads this. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third, and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, 
he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too, be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be long time in coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. For everyone who's been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. Verse 49. I have come to cast fire upon the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo. And how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you, no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And he was also saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say, it will be a hot day, and it turns out that way. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? For while you're going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate, on your way there, make an effort to settle with him so that he may not drag you before the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I say to you, <clears throat> you will not get out of there until you've paid the very last cent. Now, the last time we were together, we noted that Jesus had been teaching a, a large crowd, thousands of people stepping on one another, literally, and he was teaching them about how to live out one's faith while living in this fallen world. And Jesus' teaching is very practical. For example, in verses 15 through 21, he tells us how to guard our hearts against every form of greed. Why? For not even, and I quote, when one has an abundance, does his life consist of his possessions. Your soul, the value, the worth of a soul. Far more valuable than anything this world has to offer. And then in verses 22 through 32, Jesus talked about worry. And why we don't need to be anxious about what we will eat, drink, or wear. Because our Heavenly Father knows what we need. And He will faithfully meet our needs. Well, as Jesus continued to teach the crowd, He moved from the nuts and bolts of living by faith and avoiding the traps of greed and worry to being ready for His return at the end of the age. And a cursory glance at his words might leave one wondering, well, what's the connection here? But as we dig deeper into his teaching, I think it becomes clear that the first two topics naturally, logically, and rightly flow into the third. You see, 
The person who is living out their faith in Jesus Christ is the same person who's prepared for the Son of Man's return. The two go hand in hand. Now, towards the end of Luke 12, Jesus gives a sober warning about how important it is to discern the signs of the times. And I think this is very important for us to pay you know, super attention to right now. We got to pay deep attention to what's going on in these words here so that we may discern the signs of the times. You see, God wants us to know where things stand. And he wants us to be prepared. For Israel, he gave them signs, prophetic signs, and confirmed things through his word and through miracles about the coming of Jesus Christ so that they would be ready, that they would be prepared. Obviously, they were not. In the same way, there will be signs so that our generation will be able to discern the time of Christ's return that is near. And the signs of the times that Jesus refers to in Matthew's gospel, and we spent a lot of time there, and I would encourage you to go back and take a listen to Matthew 24 and 25, where we talk about the end times, the signs of the times. But I wanted to summarize some of them here. For instance, in Matthew's gospel, he talks about there being false prophets and false messiahs who will mislead many. That there will be wars and there will be rumors of wars. That there will be famines and earthquakes that will grow greater in intensity and frequency as the events of the last days draw near. And there will be a massive apostasy, a falling away from the faith as unrighteousness and worldliness increase while the love of many grows cold, according to Matthew 24, verse 12. So as we study Jesus' teaching tonight about the end times, I want us to keep one thing very, very clear. There is a central point to all of this. We are accountable for our choices. We must also remember, though, that God loves us. So that's why he warns us. So according to Luke 12, if you're taking notes, the first principle that Jesus gave regarding his return is be dressed in readiness. When it comes to the return of Jesus Christ, be dressed in readiness. It's a command. Over and over again, Jesus presses into us the importance of being dressed in readiness. And to emphasize the importance of his point, he gave several illustrations or analogies or word pictures to impress on our souls the urgency of being dressed in readiness. And each of these word pictures is filled with insights which I believe we would be wise to apply to our lives. This idea of being dressed in readiness, a facet of it means this, to keep the fire of your soul lit. Keep the fire of your soul lit. Throughout the Bible, the picture of a lamp that is lit and burning oil, it represents the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of God. God's people. The Holy Spirit is the very life of God within believers. The Holy Spirit is the one who transforms us so that we may love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, according to Luke chapter 10, verse 27. And we need to see what's the end goal here. By transforming us, he is preparing us for an eternity with God. That conforming you and me into the image of Jesus Christ is preparing us for an eternity with him. He's getting us ready. He's transforming us. 
And it's important for us to see that there's a connection, an important connection between our eternal destination and the preparation of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You see, our eternal destination and the Holy Spirit's preparation, they go hand in hand. I mean, we all take trips. And you know as well as I, we prepare for our trips differently based on where we're going. If we're headed to the mountains, do we bring a bathing suit? No, you, you bundle up. And if you go to the coast, to the beach, do you bundle up? Well, here in Oregon, you do. <laughs> but if you go maybe to Southern California or to Hawaii, no, you're going to bring a swimsuit. Hey, if you're going camping, you're going to prepare a certain way. And if you go to Africa, you're going to prepare a different way. Well, there's a spiritual principle that applies. You see, if you're preparing for an eternal relationship with God, what do you need? You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because he is the very life of God in us. And the moment a person places his or her faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sin so that they may receive the gift of everlasting life, at that moment, the Holy Spirit indwells them and begins to transform them so that they may live victoriously through him while they wait for Christ's return. But associated with this is another important principle. The life of God is what happens within our hearts individually, personally, which means no one can have the life of God for you. It's yours. It's personal, as Pastor Rich would like to say, as he rightly says. I mean, just to illustrate the point this way, um, what benefit would you derive from watching someone else exercise? Okay, I want a, an exercise coach, you know, who's going to help me out. And I'm going to find the perfect exercise coach. And this is what I'm going to say to him. I'm going to pay you whatever you want, but here's what I want. I want to get healthy while I watch you exercise. What are they going to think about me? Well, likely they will take my money, but then they're going to think I'm kooky dukes, right? I mean, how... Heart healthy will I get watching someone else run on a treadmill? How buff will my muscles get if I'm watching someone else lift weights? The same principle applies spiritually. You see, we can't watch someone else's relationship with God. We need to have that experience with God ourselves. We must personally ask Jesus Christ to be our Savior. We must personally be filled with the Holy Spirit. We must personally be dressed every moment of every day in readiness. We must personally keep the fire of our souls lit by walking with and in the Holy Spirit. It's personal. I can't do it some, through someone else's efforts. And frankly... I can't even do it through my own efforts. It's something that I need through the work of the Holy Spirit, the life of God in me and in you. And if you want to be ready for Christ's return, it's personal. It's personal. And that's why we're told in Zechariah 4, verse 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And with this idea of keeping the fire of your soul lit, being dressed in readiness, is this idea of being watchful and alert. In verses 36 through 38, Jesus is calling us to remain faithful. Like keeping our lamps lit, the word of God repeatedly emphasizes the importance of being watchful and alert. God wants us to walk faithfully, and when we do, we also need to see it comes with a blessing, a blessing, because our God, our God blesses faithfulness. He does. 
God blesses faithfulness. Look at verse 37. Notice how the master serves his faithful servants. They've been waiting the second or third watch. And then he says, now you recline at the table. And then he girds himself as they relax and he serves them. That's a role reversal. Any picture from scripture come to mind? How about the last supper? When Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Remember that? There you have that picture. What a beautiful thing. God says, I'm going to personally bless you because you were faithful. You were watchful. You were alert. So Jesus is telling us to live with a heart of anticipation, eagerly watching and waiting. Jesus emphasizes this point over and over because no one knows the day or the hour. Therefore, we must live as if he were coming at any time. The evangelist D.L. Moody was once asked by a great preacher, F.B. Meyer, what is the secret of your success? And I'll never forget Moody's response. He said, for many years, and I quote, I have never given an address without the consciousness that the Lord may come before I have finished the imminent return of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, if you live like Christ could come at any moment, do you think that will change your thought life? Do you think that will change what you say to people? Do you think that will change what you watch on the internet? I think it will. It becomes a great, great, great sense of accountability. What an encouragement. The Lord could come at any time, and I want to be doing what he wants me doing when he comes. That anticipation and eagerness keeps our lives spiritually watchful and alert. But if someone believes their master is not coming for a long time, he will live a spiritually slothful and lazy life. You know, like a, maybe you experience this. Children, they're old enough to leave at home. You give them some chores while you're away. You say, because they ask, well, when are you going to come home, Dad and Mom? Oh, in about three hours. When do you think those chores get done? Do you think they're working the entire three hours? Or do you think they get it done on the front end and then they just relax the rest of the way? Oh, no, 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 no. You know what happens. They wait to the last minute. And then they are flying through the house to tidy things up, and they hope you don't notice what they missed. Correct me if I'm wrong. Now, I don't know this by experience because I was a perfect little angel. <laughs> Did I just hear thunder? Yeah. But you get my point. You see, there's a danger. When we stop looking for Jesus, we stop living for Jesus. When we stop looking for Jesus, we can fall into a trap where we stop living for Jesus. And if we stop living for Jesus, we won't be ready when Jesus returns. Therefore, be dressed in readiness. Keep the fire of your soul lit. Be watchful and alert because Jesus is coming when he is not expected. Jesus is coming when he is not expected. Jesus uses several parables or analogies to make his point that he, the Son of Man, will come at a day and an hour when he is not expected. In verses 38 through 40, he uses the picture of the second or even the third watch, would be nine, which would be 9 p.m. or 3 a.m. By the way, theologically speaking, this also indicates his return may take longer than expected. For those who wonder, why is it taking so long? Jesus also uses the picture of a thief coming at an unexpected hour. I mean, if the head of the house had known that the, uh, the hour of the break-in, he would not have allowed the thief to come into his home. 
However, since he doesn't know the hour or the day, he must always stand ready. In another place, Jesus uses the illustration of the bridegroom coming for his bride. We're told in Matthew chapter 24, verses 35 and 36, verses that have been misunderstood by many, and I want to explain here. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. What does that mean? Well, this is a picture of a Jewish wedding here. In a Jewish wedding, only the father knows the hour or the day when the bridegroom would return for his bride. Let me explain. The Bible tells us that the Jewish wedding is a picture of the relationship between Jesus and his bride. Just look at Ephesians chapter 5. This picture of the Jewish wedding also gives us insights into the events of the end times. First, it's important to note that a woman was not required to marry against her will. The man would go and ask for the father's permission first, but then he would have to go to ask for the woman's permission as well. And if she agreed to the proposal, he would give her a gift, perhaps a coin, Rings became a later tradition. The coin or the ring is a pledge. It's like a down payment, a guarantee that what I've started, I will finish. Now, what's fascinating is the Apostle Paul uses similar language regarding the Holy Spirit given to believers. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Now it is God who makes us both, you and us, stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. The couple would then enter into the marriage covenant. They were technically married during the engagement. That was considered marriage at that point. Just hadn't been finalized yet. Which is symbolized by drinking a cup together. Then the groom, he would go away and prepare a home for his bride. And this was usually an extension of his father's home or likely a home nearby on his father's property. Now, Again, it takes us right back to the upper room in the Last Supper. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples, John 14, verses 1 through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So here, the groom is working on the house. He's getting it all ready. And he's waiting for the final inspection, not from the county, from his dad. And when the father was satisfied, with the condition of his son's home, that it was in good order, then he made all the preparations for the wedding feast. And oh, by the way, since he's paying for it and he's preparing it, he's the one who gets to set the day and the hour. There's the picture. There's the idea. Jesus could not make his point any clearer. And what's the big idea through it all? Now is the time to get ready. Now is the time to get ready. After exhorting us to be dressed in readiness, Jesus shifts his focus in the next verses. And he gives us specific reasons to be ready. Like this. Blessed is the faithful and sensible steward. If you want to be blessed... Be faithful. Be a faithful and sensible steward because there is great reward for those who are faithful while they're waiting. 
You see, they're, they're living by faith in expectation that the Lord will reward those who are faithful to him. You see, God will bless those who are faithful with what has been entrusted to them. And you might be thinking, well, what's been entrusted to me? Life. Life. The greatest gift of all. Life. What will you do with your life? You see, if you're faithful with what you've been entrusted with, then when you're with the Lord for all eternity, he will give you more. Faithful in the little things, you'll be entrusted with much more. That's what Jesus was talking about. But he also warns about what will happen to those who are unfaithful with what God has given to them. You see, the foolish person is the one who says in their heart, I've got lots of time. There's no need to hurry. I'll, I'll party now. And then I'll get right with God later. But you know what the problem with this kind of thinking is? These people, and the truth is, even though they try to deny it, they know it. They know they need to get right with God. They know deep down they have to get right with God. They can do all the gymnastics they want to try to get out of it, but they know. You see, the real issue is they really don't want to get their life right before God. They don't want to get their life right before God. They got it all messed up. They think that a last-minute cleaning of the house is all that's required. But they don't know that there's a big difference between a last minute clean and a deep clean. You know, some people believe that being ready means you do a quick clean. Hey, you, you move some furniture around just to make it look fresh and call her good. But the problem with the quick clean is it's not good enough. We need a deep clean. And the only way that happens is when you invite Jesus Christ into your house. You let your life be built on the rock of Jesus Christ. You throw open all the doors, all the closets, all the cobwebs. You say, clean, deep clean, my soul, my house. Well, I tell you what, the person who does that, they are blessed. But how tragic it will be for the soul who does not. Matthew 7, verses 26 and 27, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. You see, the return of Jesus Christ is going to happen. And it's going to be the most spectacular event the world has ever witnessed. And again, I think the world gets it. Though they try to suppress it, they try to twist it and do gymnastics, get out of it. They know. I mean, they even use interesting spiritual phrases to describe various events that happen in life. I mean, if someone is having a career-changing meeting, what do they call it? A come-to-Jesus meeting. When California shut down 10 miles of I-405 a few years back, what do they call it? Carmageddon. Now, newspapers, what do they do? They, they use different size letters on the front page according to the significance of the event. And the greatest events of all require the use of the second coming type on the front page. The second coming type. Oh, they can try to twist it any way they wish, but deep down they know. They even use phrases that make it clear they do. But here's the thing. There really, really will be a terrible battle called Armageddon. And so now is the time to come to Jesus because the signs of the times are all around us. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 32, now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. 
so you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. You see, time is of the essence. So let's be ready and let's make our lives count. Let's be used by God to change lives. Let's be ready so we can be used by God to change lives. What does Jesus Christ want us to be doing with our lives? Answer, God wants us to be doing what he's doing, building up those whom he loves. And how does God do that? God does this by reconciling people to himself through Jesus Christ, his son. You see, once we're reconciled to God, God's not done There's more to be done. He gives us a ministry of reconciliation so that we may help others be reconciled to God. That's our primary purpose for being here, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to help others be reconciled to God as we've been reconciled to God. That's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 21. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Every time you share about Jesus, God is speaking through you to them And he is communicating a message, be reconciled to God. You are Christ's ambassador. The Lord wants us to be faithful, therefore, until he returns. We need to be about his business. Even in times like these, when it's so easy to shrink back, close down shop, circle the wagons, Oh, I know things are difficult, and I know things are going to get worse, and we have to avoid the temptation of shrinking back. This is the time when we press in. It reminds me of Y2K. Anyone remember Y2K? What happened with Y2K? I was living in Texas at the time, and you know, with Y2K, there was this real big concern that as we went from 1999 to the year 2000, the computer systems wouldn't handle it. There goes the power grid. Planes are going to drop from the sky. All hell is going to break loose. Now in Texas, because they have their own grid, they didn't care what happened to the rest of the country. They thought they would be fine. That being said, I knew people who were moving to Texas because they wanted to be safe during Y2K. In fact, I knew an individual who sold everything that they had. And they went and lived on this remote piece of property down near the border. And it didn't go too well for him. This guy's a believer. It didn't go too well for him. Why? Because the person he went to go live with took all of his money. Here he thought, by getting away from it all, I'll be safe. And he actually put his family in jeopardy. What's my point in all of this? Oh, it's easy to begin to withdraw. I'm just going to withdraw. Be under the radar. Brothers and sisters, this is the time where we need to let our light shine. This is the time where we need to shine bright. We've got the only message that people need to hear. And we need to be on point, on message. Let's not get distracted by many things. There's only one message, Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Can you do that? Then you're helping people be reconciled to God. Now is the time. Be alert. Be ready. Be dressed for readiness. Keep the the fire of your soul lit. But you might be wondering, how can I make a difference? 
I'm just one person. Again, I turn to the words of D.L. Moody because he wrote the following words next to Isaiah 6, verse 8 in his Bible. And I quote, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. Now, what does Isaiah 6, 8 say? Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. And that's what we pray. Revive us, God. Revive us. Father, reveal anything in our hearts that is keeping readiness away, alertness away, faithfulness away. Give our lives to you, Lord. Father, we we ask that Jesus would be the, the savior of our soul, the forgiver of our sin. We receive that gift of eternal life through faith in him alone. We ask that you'd fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. And we pray that we would be faithful until that trumpet sounds. The Lord descends. The dead in Christ rise first. And then we who remain will be caught up in the air to be with the Lord. Oh, how we long for that day. But may we be faithful until that day. Revive us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Lord, open people's eyes to the truth of the gospel. Set the captives free. Give us divine appointments with people that we need to share the good news of Jesus Christ with. We are yours, Lord. Here we are. Send us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Can we give thanks to our Lord? Amen.